Shalom, shalom. And if you didn't hear me the first time, shalom, shalom. I am Pastor Juanita Weiss of Malchut Chaim Messianic Congregation. And uh, my husband is our congregational leader, Rabbi David. And so it is such a joy to be with you for another installment in our study in the Egeret, that is the epistle of Yaakov, which is James. Uh, and we are looking at this epistle through Jewish lenses. So to those of you who are watching via Facebook, we say shalom to you. And to those of you who are watching via Zoom, shalom to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, as always to our studio audience. <laughs> They bid you shalom as well. So uh, let's get into our study. We are now studying, as we said, the Egeret of Yaakov, that is James, and we're looking at it through Jewish lenses. We've already taken a look at um, chapter one, verses one and two, and so we're going to continue from that point. But um, just by way of background, we want to remember that this Yaakov, according to most scholars, of course, is the brother of Yeshua, and the uh, and also that uh, we know that Yaakov is writing to those in the diaspora, and the diaspora, of course, would be those who are exiled from Jerusalem, and we know at this time that they are dealing with some persecution. So. Um, uh, James makes it a point of writing to them. Sorry about this here. He makes it a point of writing to them in uh, his get it. Um, also, he knows that they're going to deal with a lot of trials and a lot of tribulations. So uh, he's giving them wisdom. And James, as you see, Yaakov, um, is considered to be wisdom literature. Um, there was, um, it was probably one of the last uh, letters to be included in the canon. And so we want to take a look at it through wisdom, through the eyes of wisdom and as wisdom literature. So therefore we're going to be um, referencing a lot of the uh, Proverbs. We're going to be referencing a lot of um the studies and the teachings of Yeshua. So let's go ahead and get into this because there's something that James begins with and he says, Shalom, right? He says, rejoice, basically. But they are in a, a difficult situation. They are in the diaspora. They are away from Jerusalem. But he says to them, rejoice. And, um, we see that this becomes really the greeting of Rav Shaul when he's writing his um, epistles as well. But let's take a look at this as I uh, we take a look at the scripture. He says, consider it pure joy, all joy, my brothers. Once again, uh, we talked about that in our last session. So you'll probably want to go back and take a look at that. And you can do that on our website at Malchuk Chaim. Uh, on our or on YouTube, I should say, on YouTube at Malchut Chaim Messianic Congregation. Uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And remember, we uh, discovered also that he's just not talking about trials necessarily that we bring upon ourselves, but those that we fall into, those where we're just going about living our lives. And um, these trials and difficulties um, befall us. And so this is what James is talking about. As you live your lives, as you live lives of peace and shalom and difficult times will come upon you, he says, this is how you're to regard them. You're to count them as joy, not just for the sake of it, like, oh, I want all of these trials so that I can experience joy. That's not what uh, he's talking about. Just go about your life, live your life, um, living it for Yeshua, doing the mitzvot, reading Torah, following Torah, and difficulties will come. Uh, he says, because you know, and verse three is where we are, because you know 
that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now, uh, and he says here, uh, I guess we need to continue. Perseverance must finish this work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, and let's endurance, let perseverance have her perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So this idea of endurance that we talked about, it, it means patience. So in some translations, uh, you will find patience there instead of endurance. You might find fortitude in some translations or steadfastness, and you will see perseverance as well. But he says, let this idea of pressing through, you going through it, you know, it's not like you're running from it, but you're going through it. You're enduring this thing that has befallen you and it will have its perfect work. That idea of perfect work, you'll find that in a lot of translations, um, but it comes from the Greek word teleos, teleos. And in the Septuagint, right, the, the Hebrew um, Tanakh, the Hebrew scripture translated into Greek, the word that would be used there is was tamim. So that teleos would be translated from the word tamim in Hebrew. So this tamim, to understand even teleos, we've got to go back to how this word um, was regarded in the Hebrew scriptures in the Tanakh. And so we have to look at the word tamim. We see that word, first of all, in Genesis 6, 9, where it refers to Noah. And, and this is what it says about Noah. These are the genealogies of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was a Sadiq. He was blameless tamim among his generation. And Noah walked uh, continuously with God. And there's this uh, debate or uh, this makloket, if you will, among the Jewish sages as to what, the, what does it mean that Noah was blameless, that he was tamim. And of course, they look at this and say that he was tamim uh, according to all, everybody else who was in his generation, right? Because ev everyone else had gone uh, the way of uh, sin and destruction but Noah was Tamim. He was blameless among this generation that he found himself in. So some even think that the word uh, comes from uh, uh, the idea of the Corbinote system, the system of sacrifices, whereby when you selected a sacrificial animal, that animal had to be judged to be perfect and complete, that that animal was lacking nothing. That means it was not bruised. There was, uh, there was no blemish there. It meant that the animal had been tested and approved. So he's saying, let endurance have its perfect work. Endurance takes us into the time of testing. And as we endure, we begin to pass the test that now we are in. And so this animal then, uh, they had a whole system whereby uh, the Levites, there were Levites who were in charge of the sacrificial animals. So these Levites had to inspect the animal, making sure that when it was brought to the altar, when it was brought to the temple, right? To the mitzbeach, um, to, the, to the altar, then it was perfect. It was tamim. It was blameless. And in the Hebrew, uh, in the Greek understanding, it was teleos, right? It was perfect. So the animals intended for sacrifice had to be tamim. In Exodus 12, 5, it says, your lamb is to be without blemish. Well, guess what the word is there? Yes, tamim. There was nothing to be found on it. And now he says, 
James says, and remember, James Yaakov had a Hebraic understanding, a Jewish mindset, right? He knew Torah. He, he knew all the customs and the rituals. And so when he speaks of this Tamim, he understands that you have to draw that from the Corbinote system, from the sacrificial system. And so uh, he says, your lamb must be without blemish. That means, and let endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, that you may be tamim, that you may be teleos. So this teleos then uh, is associated with completeness. And um, actually the a Messianic writer by the name of McKee says that it means the maturity of an individual. So that idea of tamim in terms of the animal would mean that this animal is ready for sacrifices, ready to be, be presented to Hashem and for us to be talios and to, to be tamim, it means that we are complete and mature as an individual. So um, the lexicon, the BDAG as a English Greek, uh, Greek English lexicon says that it pertains to being fully developed in a moral sense. So James is, says, James is saying to them, Yaakov is saying, listen, you are in the diaspora. You are going to encounter many trials. They're just going to befall you just as a result of you being where you are and your being a believer in Messiah. So these will befall you. But let endurance, endure it, count it all joy, endure it and let endurance have its perfect work so that you will be tamim, so that you will be talios. And so what is he saying then? He says their completeness or perfection is not a once and done deal. Right? Uh, and that's what he's saying to us as well. It's not a once and done deal. This involves endurance. It involves fortitude. It involves perseverance. Even though it's not a once and done deal, that's still our target. We still are targeting th this idea of Tamim, of Telios. We're still targeting it. And But the path toward Telios, the path toward being Tamim is perseverance. It's endurance, it's the testings, it's the trials, it's the tribulations, they will come. Um, Rav Shaul says, um, act, actually in uh, Acts 14, as he's talking to the, the, the congregation, he says, it is with great tribulations that we must enter into the kingdom of God. So we know that this will come and we cannot think it's strange, the fiery trials that befall us. We cannot think it's strange. And I know oftentimes we say, oh, it's spiritual warfare. But James Yaakov is saying to them, expect the trials. Know that they will come. But you can count it all joy. Because what's being worked out in you is endurance so that you will be Tamim, so that you will be Talios. Now, it's very interesting that this word is used in Matthew 5, uh, 48. Matthew 5, 48. And um, the uh, example from Exodus, as someone is asking about Exodus, Exodus 12, 5, where we see that this lamb is without blemish, is Tamim. Uh, Matthew 5, 48 says, therefore be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. This is very interesting, right? You've got that same word so that you will be perfect and complete. Um, now, when the Delich, the Delich is the uh, is a Hebrew translation of, uh, of the Greek. 
So they're translating it from Greek into Hebrew. And Delich uses the word, therefore be perfect from Matthew 5, 48 as tamim. He says it's tamim. And once again, the uh, Greek English lexicon says, this is what tamim means. And I just want to reiterate this for us as we draw this parallel. It means being complete and meeting all expectations with integrity, with whole, complete, undamaged, intact blamelessness. All of that. This is what he's saying. Therefore, be perfect, be complete, meet all the expectations of the Father, because as the Father is, so should you be, right? Be whole, be complete, be undamaged, be intact, be blameless. Now, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, we find uh, a very similar situation going on. Uh, Paul writes to the congregation at Thessalonica, and he says, now may the God of Shalom, and here in the Greek it's Irene, but it's the same as Shalem in, um, in Hebrew, uh, may the God of Shalom himself make you completely holy and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept complete, blameless at the coming of our Lord Yeshua Messiah. Faithful is the one who calls you and he will make it happen. Isn't that exciting? That Hashem will make it happen. All you have to do is endure. <laughs> you endure and he will make it happen. He will be right with you in the test. He will be right with you in the tribulation. He is the one who causes you to endure as long as you have that mindset, I will endure this, right? So going back to First Thessalonians 5.23, he says, may the God of Shalom himself make you completely holy. Well, within that word is, is teleos, in that, within that Greek word, make you completely holy holy. Well, how is this done? It is done through endurance, the endurance of the trials and the testings and the tribulations that will um, uh, befall you, according to James Yaakov. <clears throat> also here, I, I wanted to take a look at this because I thought it was interesting. And in, back in my, Matthew 5, 48, where therefore be perfect, the delich Hebrew uh, translation says, uses the word tamim. Well, the Salkinson Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament used the, uses the word shalem. For Matthew 5, 48, therefore be perfect. So he's saying, therefore be shalem, right? And we understand, those of us with a messianic background, we understand what shalom means, right? It, it means all of these things that we've said, it means to uh, be whole and complete. It means to lack nothing. It means to be intact. It means to be blameless. It means to uh, have all that you need without lack. There's no lack there in Shalem. So he says, be Shalem just as your father in heaven is Shalem. You be complete. You be whole, complete and lacking nothing. Now, it's very interesting. So how do uh, the, the sages regard this, right? How, what is the rabbinic understanding of this idea of completeness, of shalem, of tamim? And in Genesis Rabbah 79.5, and um, this is a midrash on uh, the book of Genesis, it says this, uh, it, mean, it says that complete means completeness is in body, in your children, in property, and in wisdom. Very interesting that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he says, may the Lord make you completely holy, what? In your spirit, in your soul, and in your body. So the neshama, so um, your nefesh and your goof, 
all of that, right? All of that is included in, in wholeness. But Genesis Rabbah says it means complete in body, in children, in property, and in wisdom. Well, where do they get this? Because that's a commentary really on Genesis 28, 21. Now, Yaakov, when he left home, he was running away from his brother Esau, and he's praying to Adonai. And he says, listen, if I go out and I return to my father's house in Shalom, then Adonai will be my God. Well, what is he talking about? Well, the rabbis looked at this statement and they said, it's Shalem, right? If I return in Shalom, then he means in body, in children, in property, and in wisdom. So it's Shalem begufu, in body, in my goof, Shalem bivanav, in with my children, all of my um my my children there in property bimamono he says if i have all of my property intact and guess what yaakov returns just that right he has children that he didn't have before he has two wives he has all of this property so much so that he wanted to offer some to to his brother esau uh just so that um uh that that he could seal the deal that that the, that the two of them could walk in shalom actually, so so here we see tamim shalem, and Yaakov is saying, let endurance have its perfect work, let it work itself out because when endurance works itself out, guess what? You're going to be complete. You're going to be perfect. You're going to be shalem. You're going to be tamim. You're going to be teleos. Therefore, you will lack nothing. This is what he's saying to those in the diaspora. And that's, beloved, that's where we are. Outside of Israel, we are in the diaspora. And the same thing he says to them, he's saying to us today that we would receive it as wisdom from Yaakov, wisdom from the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So, and let endurance have its perfect work. So um, this idea of endurance, uh, I think this is what we should understand. Remember, it's not a one and done deal. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, McKee, the Messianic writer says this in his commentary, he says, the perfection of James is eschatological. What does that mean? That means that he's looking ahead to its fullest maturity. And you know when that will be, beloved? <laughs> I have those in my studio audience saying, yes, we are well aware of when that will be. It will be at the end time when God's purposes have been achieved, right? It's when, that's when we will reach our fullest maturity until earthly life is relatively over for the individual. So what is he saying? Endure to the end. Persevere to the end. If you do that, endurance will have her perfect work and you will be shalem. And that's how you will be presented to the father, right? Tamim, like that offering that had been watched over, that offering that had been protected, right? That sacrifice, that was now ready to be offered to Hashem. Wow, that's beautiful, actually. But until then, we have to endure the trials. En route to the goal, we have to strive to attain the fulfillment of God's plan. What is his plan that we will endure? Right? We can't um, excuse ourselves, right? We can't say, oh, I'm... Uh, I'm only human, right? Yes, you are. But James said, endure. If you let patience, endurance, perseverance have a perfect work, you can do this. You can do this. So we won't allow failure to block the way to that end goal that we will see at the end of the age. We will not allow that because actually, um, I, I think we have... Um, 
uh, a remedy for that. Um, the psalmist says that the righteous man falls seven times and every time the Lord will pick him up. So get up. We can do this. We can endure. We can wipe ourselves off. We can get back in the fray, get back into the race and we can persevere and we can endure. So Psalm 34, 20 says, many are the distresses of the righteous, but Adonai delivers him out of them all. Many are the distresses. So if you think that uh, you are being uh, unduly challenged or fought in this life, think again. Many are the distresses, but we can be delivered out of them all. So as you go through, um, remember, this is the, this is a thing that helps you to run the marathon. That's what this is. This is a this is a race to the end. It's an endurance, and we can endure. Um, so this um, McKnight says in um, his commentary that was uh, cited here uh, by McKee that that. Uh, the Messianic Jewish community is to strive for a level of morality. That means character and behavior where, look, James understood, you know, it was a given. You're not to, you're not to sin, right? You're, you are to endure the things that will befall you. So you're not, he didn't expect them to literally walk into sin, right? He expected them to endure the temptations that befell them. So for them, this was manifested that this morality would be derived from a perfect God, right? Who gives perfect gifts and they have now walked in this new revelation of Messiah Yeshua. And they have the royal perfect Torah for the community. And we're going to see that James will allude to that, this, this royal law that they have. They have the Torah. So as long as they continue to observe Torah and, and to endure the things that will befall them, so he knew keeping Sabbath was a given. Eating kosher, that was a given. But what he wanted them to do, right, was to, uh, was to have the attitudes and the morals and the ethics that would help them to be able to live together and not just live together as a community, but to live together under Babylon, if you will. Babylon is that state where you are not in Israel, right? You are outside in the diaspora. You are living in Babylon. So how do we do that? How do we live under uh, pagan, unrighteous rulers? And how do we live among ourselves? So he understood they, would, they were going to keep Sabbath. That was a given. They were going to eat kosher. But the point is now giving them wisdom as to how to live together and how to live under a pagan uh, society. Um, so in verse five, as we continue there, but if any of you lacks wisdom, wow, how did he go from endurance, trials, tribulations, being perfect, right, to lacking wisdom? Let him ask God who gives to all without hesitation and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So requesting wisdom is one of the most important things that any of us can do. Because James says, if you lack it, ask, ask Hashem for it, right? So James, you know, he's the most obvious representative in the Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, of what in the ancient Israelite scriptures, the Old Covenant or the Tanakh, that we think as wisdom literature. So it would be appropriate then for James to speak of wisdom. If this is wisdom li literature, if he's giving adages and he's giving a proverbs and he's instructing them in the way to live, then it's, it, it's appropriate then that he would refer to 
the word wisdom. Um, now, we're not, mind you, Yaakov is not talking about intellectual wisdom. Oftentimes we want that, right? Um, I think one passage says that um, the, the Greek seeks wisdom, right? And we see that in Rav Shaul's day. We see that with the Greeks. It was all about wisdom. It was all about what is truth. It was all about acquiring wisdom, but not wisdom from God per se, right? It was the intellectual wisdom that they were looking for. And so, um, so but he's saying that the, the wisdom that emanates from God that is the Ruach Chokhmah, right? That's the word for wisdom in the Hebrew, Chokhmah. In the uh, Greek, it's Sophia, but it's Ruach Chokhmah. And he says, God is the only giver of this, right? The, he's the giver of the Chokhmah, um, the wisdom. So we know that wisdom is the book of Proverbs. It features prominently in the book of Proverbs. You can find it, Almost in every chapter, almost in every other verse, there's an understanding of wisdom. And Proverbs 9, 10 says this is probably the most important verse in the Tanakh on wisdom. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of chokhmah. You want chokhmah? There must be a fear of the Lord. So even in that understanding, because James, Yaakov, remember, he understood the Tanakh. He embraced the Tanakh. He he was he had a Jewish mindset, a Jewish heart. And if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we're asking Hashem for Hokma, then there must be fear of Hashem in our lives. There must be that Yirat Adonai, that that fear that causes us to reverence Him, that causes us, even though that we know that He is mighty and awesome, and and as one translation says, he's terrible in terms of his strength, right? Uh, and even in his anger, we we understand all of that. And it causes us not to run from him, but it causes us to run toward him. That's that Yerat Adonai that we must have. And when we have that, we can say to him, give us wisdom. We can ask for wisdom because he knows that we're going to use that wisdom for the sake of the kingdom and not for our own self-aggrandizement. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And oftentimes the chokmah, the, under, the knowledge, the da'at, and the understanding, the binah, they're oftentimes used together because uh, according to um, rabbinic understanding that when Adam and Chava were in the Gan Eden with Hashem, with um, with with Adonai there in the garden, that in at the wedding this was his gift to them. It was Chokmah. It was Ruach. It was it, I'm sorry. It was Chokmah. It was Bina, and um, it was Daat. And he gives them the wisdom, the knowledge, and the, and the understanding. And we see how that was used, ultimately, that even with all of that from Hashem, uh, the serpent is able to tempt Eve. Oh, you'll be like God. And he had already given them uh, Ruach Hochma, Ruach Bina, and Ruach Da'at. And so in Proverbs 3, 19 through 21, we understand this by wisdom. I do not found it in the earth. So what do we understand? That wisdom was with Hashem in the very beginning. And wisdom, we, we find out from Proverbs, did the creation, right? Did the creating. So by understanding, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, the deeps were divided and the clouds drip dew. My son, hold on to sound, to sound wisdom and discernment. Once again, Ruach, um, uh, Bina, Da'at, and Chokmah, being used together there. Now, um, <clears throat> very interesting that trials bring a necessary season 
to seek wisdom from God. So you're in this trial and you don't know, it's like, Lord, how do I pray for this trial? Right. Um, I, I think as we were going through COVID-19, there was a, uh, that whole pandemic, there was a camp that said, don't pray against it. Pray that we endure it and pray that Hashem would reveal to us what he wants us to know as we go through it. So there were those, those two camps. But that's why we seek chokhmah, ruach chokhmah, because it's like, Lord, I'm going through this difficulty. Should I ask for you to get me out of this? Is that how I should pray? Or should I pray that I that you would give me the strength to endure this? When Rob Shaul was in prison and he writes his prison epistle, one of them in, in uh, Philippians, he says, uh, it's according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness. So now as always that Messiah would be, would be, um, he would be seen in my body, whether it be by life or by death, let him be magnified in my body. It doesn't matter which, it, which way it goes. Isn't that powerful that he's saying whatever he says, if I live or if I die, that's it. That's on him, right? But he says, on me is, I don't want to make him ashamed. I don't want to blaspheme his name. I don't want to malign his character. I want him to be seen in me. And I want all of those in the Praetorian Guard, the ones that are guarding me, I don't want them to see me faltering. I don't want to see them to see me doubting God. And this is what Yaakov is saying to those in the diaspora. This is your witness to the world. So pray for, if you need chokmah, you pray for that. And if it's something that he's going to deliver you out of, then you will know that through chokmah. But if it's something that he says, you're going to get through this, you stay the test and you just walk in Kiddush Hashem. You walk in uh, a reflection of who I am and that will be enough. That will be enough. And so we must endure. So, so we don't even know uh, sometimes how we're to pray through a particular trial. How do we, how are we to pray through a sickness or a difficulty? How do we pray through that? And he says, if there's any of you that lacks wisdom, you ask of God. You know, the, uh, it, there's an apocryphal work that's uh, attributed to Solomon. Uh, it's a, in wisdom, it's called wisdom. And so in wisdom 9, 6, just to give you an understanding of Hebraic thinking and Jewish thought at the time, it expresses how wisdom is needed for genuine perfection. Uh, this is what it says. Indeed, though one be perfect among mortals, if wisdom who comes from you be lacking, that will count from, for nothing. So I may be um, amazing among mortals. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I may be absolutely amazing. It looks like, oh, uh, you don't have a care in the world. But he says, if I lack wisdom, and that wisdom comes from Hashem himself, if I'm lacking wisdom, all of my perfection, all of the things that you think about me will count for nothing at the end. Why? Basically, I'm not even going to be able to endure. I'm not even going to be able to finish my course because I'm lacking wisdom. Now, Hashem was always the source of wisdom. In Proverbs 2, 6, for Adonai gives wisdom. Out of, the, out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Once again, the three used together. Um, as you say, the Amidah on a daily basis and on, on Shabbat, um, one of the benedictions, one of the blessings is God on high who fully gives tender goodness. El El Yom, Gomel Chasidim Tovim. One of the bene this is one of the benedictions in the Amidah. And there are 13 of them, right? This is one of them. It says, you have favored man with knowledge 
and have taught mankind with understanding. From your knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, be gracious to us. Blessed are you, Lord, who has favored us with knowledge. And we need the chokmah. What do we do with the knowledge? What do we do with the da'at, with the bina? What do we do? Chokmah helps us to walk that out, right? It helps us to live it out. And this is what Rav Shaul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 6, when he um, is was with the congregation in Corinth, and he writes to them saying, look, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, <clears throat> excuse me, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. He says, I didn't come to you with man's wisdom. I, I didn't come to you with that. I didn't come to you with persuasive words, but I came to you with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, excuse me. He says, I did this so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I can tell you, beloved, as the scripture says, um, the the Jews seek seek after a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. There's nothing like looking, even especially even into the word of God, looking for something new, looking for that nugget, right? That we can use. And oftentimes when we do that, because we have the wrong perspective, it is so against even the theology of uh, the Hebraic theology and Hebraic understanding, because we're just looking for knowledge. We're just looking for that. But James says, when you're going through and you need knowledge and you have the fear of God, then you can ask of him. And he says, if you ask of him, he will give to all without hesitation and without reproach, it will be given to you. So he says, let him ask. Well, you know that it didn't say let him demand of God. Let him not say it's my right. Not let him say, if you don't do this, I can't get through this, but it's in humility. Lord, I need you. I need you. I am in this situation and it's difficult, right? Something has befallen me. I don't know whether this is something I need to pray that you get me out of or pray that I endure during this or pray that you would send me help in the midst of the struggles of those who are like-minded, who can even pray me through, who can even fast with me. I need wisdom here. I, I need wisdom to know, should I share this with anyone? With whom should I share it, right? So there's that wisdom that we need and we need to ask in humility. Um, very interesting. One theologian was bringing this up that, he gives liberally and he re refers to Alexander the Great, right? Um, so the idea when he gives liberally, he gives according to his excellent greatness. <laughs> uh, so Alexander the Great gave a poor man a city. You know, Alexander the Great conquered all the known lands. And when uh, there was nothing else for him to conquer, so he thought, it says that history bears out that he drank himself into debauchery, drunken debauchery, and, and ultimately died. Well, he is rich enough, of course, wealthy enough to give a, a poor man a city. And when he gave this poor man the city, the man refused. He refused it. He says, a city? That's too great for me. <laughs> Basically, can I just get a house, right? Not a whole city. So Alexander the Great answered, the business is not what you are fit to receive, but what it becomes me to give you, right? And, and I know Hashem is thinking the same way. It's not that you are fit to receive this, but I have the ability because all wisdom is from me and I have the ability to give it to you. I just need you to ask. Ask in humility. And you know, we might say, well, he knows that I need wisdom. He knows that. Um, it was one one source. It actually it was a book. Uh, I think it was um, uh, The Shack, actually. And it, there's something that it says there that I just took with me uh, as Rama from my own life. And as the uh, the character in the book is asking 
uh, the one who represents Hashem, asking him, um, was basically telling him about his life. And he said, well, I don't need to tell you about my life. You already know that. And the writer says that sometimes Hashem will, will suspend that aspect of himself so that he can hear it from you. And it will be as if he has heard it from you for the first time, right? Of course he knows, but he wants that relationship with us that we can ask this of him. And it will be as if he's heard it from us. Even if you ask every day, it's the first time. And he gives to us liberally, right? Liberally, it means according to his excellent greatness, according to his bounties. So, so we have to know God's generosity. We have to know that he does. He doesn't res, despise us or resent us. Remember when you were at that place? I don't know if you were there, um, like early in your walk when you just thought he was out to get you. He just didn't like you. He just hated you. Well, we we definitely rebuke that understanding, that idea, because it is definitely from the pit. He loves us. He loved us so much that he gave, right? So he doesn't despise us. He doesn't re resent us. Even when we fall, There, there's he's not despising us. And even in his mercy, right? Or I should say in his anger and in his wrath, there is grace. There is mercy for us to get up and to get back on our feet and to continue to pursue him. So he doesn't despise us. He doesn't resent us. And that should encourage us to ask of him. He, he's the God of with an open hand, right? Ready to extend that to us. So when we want wisdom, we go to the word of God. Let's go to the word of God. It's full of wisdom. James, right? This Yaakov, this epistle, this Egeret is full of wisdom. And we get to read the wisdom of God. We get to hear the heart of God. And so he says here, if you lack wisdom, ask of God in humility, right? And he will give to all without hesitation, right? And without reproach. He's not gonna rebuke you because you asked him for wisdom. And if you didn't ask in humility, then he's just, he's so patient. He waits Someone said that um, uh, the, imagine the humility of God who waits on us to wait on him, right? He waits for us to wait on him. Um, and so in verse six, it says, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So to ask Hashem, but to ask him in a doubting way shows that we are double-minded. That's what Yaakov says. If, um, you're asking and you're just like somewhere in your mind, you're saying, I know he's not going to give it to me. Um, I don't know, even know why I'm asking. He says that that's double mindedness, right? So if we had no faith, we would never ask at all. But through faith, we get to ask him. We get to ask of him. Um, so uh one scholar by the name of Hebert said uh, that double-minded is literally two-souled. It's like you have two souls, right? Um, here you're asking, but here you're doubting. You're two-souled. So the man of two souls who has one for the earth and another for heaven. It's like, yes, I'm believing him here, but I live on the earth. So that is your reality. Earth is your reality. Even though you're asking and you know that it's a heavenly thought, but earth is your reality. Um, the one who wants to be secure in both worlds, right? You want to ride the fence of double-mindedness. Um, you don't want to get your hopes up, so you don't ask. So that is, again, 
Your hope is in this life. Your hope is in this world. So you you don't want to give up on on um, give up earth, but you don't want to you know give up heaven either. So you're double minded. One of them you have to surrender. Now he says, let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea. That like a wave in the sea is clearly you. Uh, you, you have so many images from the Tanakh for uh, that uh, comparison um, because we know a wave is is um, shows inconstancy, right? It's going, it's over here and then it's over here and it's going, it's ebbing and it's flowing. And so Isaiah 57, 20 through 21 says, but the wicked are like the tossing sea. For it cannot be quiet, and its waters tossed up with refuse and mud. There is no peace, says God, for the wicked. Very interesting that Yaakov says that um, if you don't ask in faith, uh, if you're doubting, you're like a wave of the sea. And now Isaiah says the one who is like being tossed by the waves of the sea he considers them to be wicked. Well, this idea of asking God and not in faith, but being double-minded is wickedness with God, right? Well, let's consider this. Sirach, which is um, uh, a work in the Apocrypha, says this in, in Sirach 33, one through two. This is what it says. Um, it shows how a, um, a person who is hypocritical is like a boat tossed around in, the, in a sea. And this is what it says. No evil will befall the man who fears the Lord, but in trial, he will deliver him again and again. A wise man will not hate the law, but he who is hypocritical about it is like a, a boat in a storm. Basically, Yeshua you know, says the same thing about hypocrisy, right? He hates it. It's a sin. And so being double-minded, having um, a, pull, a tug on the in the earth and a tug in the heaven to, to Hashem is hypocrisy. And it's like the one who is in a, in a boat, in a storm, you're being tossed to and fro. Uh, in verse 6, uh, we see that verse six, there are parallels Ephesians 4, 14. It says, where we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So here's another thing. When we are doubting, right? When we are double-minded, not only is it wickedness and hypocrisy before Hashem, but we become like children. Not, not the children that Yeshua speaks of, but we're like children tossed here and there by the waves, right? And carried about by every wind of doctrine. We believe this today and we believe that tomorrow. Not only that, we believe this this morning and then in the evening we believe something else. He says, that's what you're like when you're, when you're doubting and you're double-minded, you're just blown by the sea and blown by the wind and you're in, in a boat and you're tossed to and fro. And he says, that's, that's not who you should be. So, um, so evil people are asserted by Jude in Jude 13. This is what it says in Jude, Jude 13. They're the evil people are to be wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. This image is used of the double-minded. It's used of those who are like children who have no footing in the word of God. It's used of those who are hypocrites, right? It's used of those who are vacillating uh, between faith and doubt. And in Isaiah 57, 20, we see again, but the wicked are like a troubled sea, 
for it cannot rest and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no shalom, no rest, says my God for the wicked. And if that's the wicked, the hypocritical, the doubting, we don't want to be a part of that, right? We say, Lord, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us hope that we are not double-minded, that you, that through this endurance, right, through this perseverance, as you are with us, our faith is increased. So asking for wisdom in faith means committing ourselves to obey what God reveals. Wow. If we're asking in faith, in imuna, right? In pistis in the Greek, if we're asking, we're saying, Lord, whatever you tell me, I'm going to do. If you say, don't pray that we that I should be taken out of this trouble, right? Or this trouble should be done away with, but that I would endure through it. So knowing that as I go through it, there is an end to it right? There's an end. We just have to get through it. If that's what you tell me, Lord, may I receive that, right? In faith, and may I endure, and may I do all that I can do to endure, that I would be steeped in the word of God, that I would be steeped in prayer, that there would be fasting, and that I would, uh, there would others be others who would come alongside me and pray and uh, walk me through with me, through this difficulty that I am in. I think in, in uh, Philippians 2, Rav Shaul tells them, even as he's in prison, he says, I know that through your faith and through your prayers, that this is, will work out for my deliverance. And what was deliverance for him? Deliverance was not being get taken out of jail. Do you know what he was able to do in jail? It's like he was able to witness to the whole Praetorian guard. Every guard that was there shackled to him or watching over him, they heard about the risen Yeshua. They heard about the risen Yeshua. And so he's like saying, oh, no, don't take me out of this. If that's not your will, let me just endure it and let me not bring to you any shame, that there would be no shame that I would bring to the name of Hashem. Absolutely powerful. Now, as we continue in, remember, let me just recap verses six, verse six, because we're going to go into seven and eight. But let them ask, let him ask in faith, without doubting. If you want wisdom, just ask in imunah. Imunah means, in, within that we understand the emet, uh, that there's going to be a shema, that I'm going to hear you, Abba, and I'm going to do what you say, Right? Without any doubting, I'm going to believe if I ask you for wisdom, you're going to give it to me. I'm just going to believe that, right? Whether it comes through a downloading, and oftentimes it's, it's not even a download. It's like, you know, <laughs> faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's like, let me get into the word, right? Oftentimes we just want to download and I'm not, uh, I know I've, I'm there, I've been there, and probably will be there again. But he's saying, get into my word, right? That will strengthen your faith. So let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. And remember, the wave of the sea, hypocrisy, um, uh, a faith like, uh, like a child, theology like a child. You have no sure footing, right? Um, you're double-minded and therefore that's wickedness before God, right? Who are you serving if you're double-minded? And we'll get to that in just a second because, because James Jacob deals with that as well. Blown and tossed by the wind, this, again, this image that is, is, is full, right? In the Tanakh uh, of, of the wicked being tossed for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Wow. Can you imagine? You prayed for wisdom, but somewhere there was a doubt. And now you're expecting Hashem to give you wisdom. 
And he says, don't expect me to give you that because you, you're, you didn't even ask in faith. And now, because we're not asking in faith, now we begin to blame Hashem, right? And think that he doesn't hear us and think that he doesn't care. And he does care, beloved, he cares. Uh, so let's look at this. So um, for that person, verse seven, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So in verse four, he tells us you have to be perfect and complete. What leads to that is endurance, right? Letting endurance have its perfect work so that you could be shalem, so that you could be tamim, so that you could be teleos. In verse five, he says that there should be no hesitation and you should do it without reproach if you're going to ask him. So no hesitation, once again, the firmness, right? The resoluteness. And in verse six, he says, without any doubting for the one who doubts, right? Like a wave tossed in the sea. So this double-mindedness, according to, um, it's, a, it's a medieval midrash on the book of Proverbs. It's midrash Mishle. Uh, in 1210, right? it refers to two minds. So literally it's saying you like have, you have two kidneys and you do, but this is different. <laughs> Uh, but it's like two minds that will bend a person toward good, but also away from it. So when you're double-minded, it says, you've got this mind, part of you will bend toward good, but in the same instance, it's going to turn you toward evil, right? So you have two, two hearts and both are good and evil advisors. Can you imagine that? Right. You've got some one uh, little imp speaking to you over here and a little angel speaking to you over here. And and ultimately, when you're double minded, you're going to go with the imp. Definitely. So in Ecclesiastes 10, 12 through 14, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but the lips of a fool destroy him. The words from his mouth begin as folly and end as grievous madness and the fool multiplies words so words from the mouth of the wise are gracious but the lips of a fool destroy him right we, we will know the foolish when you open your mouth what comes out of it determines whether you're wise or you're fool um psalm 32 10 through 11 many are the sorrows of the wicked but the loving kindness surrounds the one who trusts in Adonai. Be glad in Adonai and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all who are upright in heart. We need to have one heart. It, we have to have one heart. The one that is upright in heart, that's the one who can rejoice. That's the one who can shout for joy. That's the one who can ask of Hashem in faith nothing doubting and not only asking in faith, but believing in faith that you have the thing that you ask, right? So, so James is saying those who have a steadfast love, those who um, have this kind of integrity that comes from single hearted purpose, single hearted mo motive, Lord, I'm in this difficulty. And I need wisdom from you as to what you want me to do. And when I know that that's what you want me to do, that's what I will do. That is the type of person that James is talking about, that Yaakov is talking about. So every possible trial um, that, a ch that the child of Hashem can go through, your believer in Messiah Yeshua, Every trial is a masterpiece. It is, it's a masterpiece of strategy of the very captain of your soul. And he's using it for good. Look at what he did for Rav Shaul in prison. He used it for good, right? And that's what he wants to do with everything that we'll go through. So let's not be double-minded. Let's believe that Hashem has a greater plan 
And, and the thing that will allow us to, to know his plan, maybe not in the beginning, but if we endure, we will look back and see what Hashem has done in our lives. So the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So if you're unstable, you waver back and forth. Uh, you will doubt. Um, and James says, don't even think that you'll receive anything of the Lord. So you're going to be uncertain about the truth of something. You're going to hesitate. Um, you will be a man or woman of divided loyalty. Oh, wow. Um, in, in the uh, Tanakh, we find that the person, you know, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, is to love God with an undivided heart, right? It's it's not, you can't love this and, and love that. As a matter of fact, it was um, uh, in the, the writer of the Hebrew says about Moses that he really understood that I, I will give up the pleasures of Egypt because it's only for a season to embrace that which is good and that which is forever, right? That which is um, tamid, that, I mean, that which is ongoing, eternal. I will give that. I, I won't be double-minded. And everything that we hold to in this life, beloved, it's going to end. And and I'm, Yaakov gets to that as well because he knows that's why we hold on to things, right? Because it's pleasurable now, but it will end. It it has a short shelf life, if you will. So he says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It is not divided. He wants all, all of us, all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. In 1 Chronicles 12, 33, there is this reference to the soldiers of Zebulun, right? So this, uh, the soldiers of Zebulun, they were serving in David's army. Well, guess who David doesn't want soldiers with a divided heart? It says that they could draw up in battle formation with all kinds of weapons of war, and they helped David out, and they helped him with an undivided heart. Beloved, that's what Hashem is calling us to do. Where is our heart? Is it divided? Um, anyone who is double-minded or two-souled is, is divided on his or her devotion with God or devotion to God. Deuteronomy 26, 16 says this. The day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and ordinances, you shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. We cannot be divided. We cannot have a divided heart when it comes to the things that Hashem has asked us to do. So the Lord expected the uh, Israelites not to waver in their dedication to him. They were to devote their entire beings to him. He wanted that for, for, for them then, and he wants that for us now, right? So when a person is double-minded, we know it, he or she will think and act from both a godly and a worldly perspective. Today, it's a godly perspective. Tomorrow, it's a worldly perspective. We cannot be double-minded. And, you know, because we can think sometimes in a godly perspective, but we operate in the worldly perspective, sometimes we will think that the worldly perspective is the right one. Um, that means that we're serving, right? The will of God and our own will, right? His will is his will. And when you die to your will and you, um, take up his will, like Yeshua did, right? It's not, it's not my will, but his will. Then you will have his will and you will have his heart. Once you die to your will, and take up the will of Hashem. We cannot speak out out of both sides of our mouths. We can't say one thing and do another. We have to be consistent, right? We must demonstrate consistency. We must be obedient to him. We must be on this single road. There are two roads, beloved, right? There's the straight and the narrow, 
which leads to destruction. And then there's the road that leads to eternal life. And we know, as uh, Yeshua says in Matthew 7, 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. And one thing that causes us to enter through this broad gate, right, is by being double-minded. Double-mindedness does not please God. And as Yaakov said, don't think that if you are double-minded that you're to receive anything from the Lord. But when we ask, we ask in faith, nothing doubting. I pray that you, for you, beloved, as you continue to pursue the heart of God, let's walk in steadfastness. Let's give him our whole heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, especially in this day in which we live, when all of these things from the world, like the, the, the political spectrum, the social spectrum, the economic spectrum, right? All of those things are pulling at us and tugging at us. And sometimes when we're going this way, um, even according to the world, we think it's God's way. God's way is God's way. It is not the way of the world. It is his way. And that's what we must focus on. Beloved, in this world, we will have tribulation, but we can be of good cheer for he has overcome the world. And if he has overcome the world, that means that you are an overcomer as well. God bless you. Shavua tov to you. Shalom uvarecha, peace and blessings. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, stay the course. Amen.